This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk with creative Mississippians. I'm your host, Kristen Brandt, Arts Industry Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm talking with Stacy Conde. Stacy is the co-founder of Alumar Natchez, a light-based art exhibition and festival in Natchez. And she is also the director for Arts Danu, a nonprofit arts organization. On top of all of this, Stacy also owns Conde Contemporary, a gallery in downtown Natchez where we're sitting right now. Today we're going to talk about how Stacy's work shines a light on the arts through the Alumar Natchez Festival. Stacy, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Tell me a little bit about yourself, Stacy, and how you came into creative practice. Well, I was born in Miami, born and raised actually in Miami. Um, my family is from Gloucester, Mississippi, Amit County, as it were, and um, nothing. We, we would come up here every summer and I just fell in love with it, fell in love with running through the woods and, and all of that. But my creative practice, I suppose, started when I was really quite young. My mother was kind of a brilliant artist, actually, um, in lots of different mediums. And she really encouraged me to explore mediums. So you have a very artistic family. Can you tell me about the other creatives in your life? Sure. So my husband is a, is a painter. He's an artist. Um, and in fact, the reason why I got into the gallery business in the first place, you know, I was out there seeing what his, his sort of struggles were like, going to galleries as an unrepresented artist, you know, and showing your work. It, it's, it's intimidating and it's really stressful for, for an artist, you know, and especially when we're talking about a certain group of visual artists who maybe aren't quite as verbal as others, you know, so I found that there are really a lot of visual artists that are neurodiverse. Um, and I just, I just wanted to sort of take up his cause and help him because it was really frustrating to me to see him uh, so frustrated, you know? And, and, and that's really kind of evolved into one of the focuses of, of my gallery. So your gallery really seeks to support artists in the ways that you know, they might not be able to advocate for themselves. Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how the whole thing started. It was really kind of a, an old school gallery, you know, where, yeah, I was paying people's rent and, and buying food and, you know, cooking even <laughs> for some of our artists initially, you know, um, and just supporting them, you know, and trying to really move their career forward and getting them to a place where uh, I wouldn't have to do all of those things, you know, by selling their work, you know, but it's, it's not easy. It's, it's really hard work to build uh, a market for an artist. So you have to have someone that you're working with, um, or at least from, from my point of view as a gallery director, a gallery owner, you know, you, you have to have someone that you really appreciate and care about because you're putting in, I mean, it really is a labor of love. It's a lot of hours. And I can see that you love your husband an awful lot. Very George. In <laughs> fact, we've been married for almost 30 years now. Oh, that's lovely. Um, Thank you. So you focus mostly on contemporary art and the gallery. What draws you to that art form? You know, I just like to work with living artists, right? It's interesting to me to see their process, to see their psychology. I really do feel that in many, many cases, you can look at an artwork and, and really understand where the artist is coming from uh, psychologically. Um, not always, obviously, but it's it's just more interesting to me, you know, to work with um, to work with contemporary artists, living artists. And you yourself are an artist, even if you might protest me calling you that. In your own creative journey, you have demonstrated a lot of diversity in your creative practices with photography, drawing, embroidery, and writing. What is it about the practice of creating that resonates so strongly with you? First of all, thank you for saying that. that that's beautiful. I, I don't typically call myself any of those things. I don't know why. I should probably have a, speaking of psychology, I should probably have a look into that. Um, 
I just find it really interesting to express myself in a variety of ways. And writing is probably my favorite because I don't have the patience it takes to paint, for example, or to sculpt. Sometimes I just want to get my thoughts out, my emotions, my feelings, whatever it is I'm trying to say. I just want to get it out quickly. And for me, writing and sometimes photography, I would say, are the are kind of the fastest ways to do that. I'm I'm an impatient person, as you can tell. Well, writing takes a great deal of patience, so I kind of <laughs> applaud you for fighting through that. Thank um, you. It's true. Do you want to hear my favorite quote on writing? Sure. Okay, so Hemingway had this great quote on writing that said, writing is easy, you just sit down at a typewriter and bleed. And I thought, that's accurate. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, so how would you describe your art to people? What themes do you pursue? For myself personally or for the work that I show in the gallery? Uh, either. Okay, so for myself personally, you will always see these kinds of themes that are universal and um, I can't think of the word for it right now. I want to say kind of never ending. They're sort of permanent, you know. So uh, if someone found a piece of work, you know, a thousand years from now, they would look at it and fully understand what it's about, right? So the subjects that I'm interested in are always based on nature or love or um, beauty, as subjective as that is, you know. Um, Things, things of that, things of that nature. I tend to stay away from politics or things that are not. They're just, they're just, they're impermanent. Do you know what I mean? And so, while something might be really poignant right now, um, again, five hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, somebody looks and they go, "What the heck are they talking about? What does this even mean?" You know. So, I well, want to reach people on a visceral level. I think. Absolutely, and you've expressed an interest in psychology and what makes people work. Yeah. So I think that you're saying that you kind of connect to those archetypical emotions and ideas that resonate with people no matter what their current context is. A hundred percent. So in my book, I purposely avoided sort of the, the, the conscious mind and went directly for people's subconscious mind, right? I wanted them to be able to see some of these, see some of the iconography in the writing, right? And just understand it on a visceral level. Like it wasn't even important to me that they looked at it and they understood what it was, or they read it and they understood what it was. But I feel like somewhere in the collective unconscious, they, they get it, you know? So getting things on a soul level is way, way more interesting to me. Absolutely, and you mentioned your book. I don't know that we've talked about the title yet. So for anyone who wants to look that up. All right, so it's called The Red Speck. And it's by S. Conde. I don't know why I didn't use my first name, but I just decided S. I was going to go with S. Mysterious. That's it. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the gallery? What could someone expect from a visit here? Well, when we first started the gallery, we, I, I represented exclusively Cuban artists and Cuban artists in the diaspora. I wasn't really working with anyone on the island, and that was a conscious decision. Um, and then as we continued to grow, I did work with a few artists in, uh, in Cuba. And then since then, all but one, if you can imagine, over the course of 10 years, all but one have immigrated, have left Cuba. So they're either in Mexico or the United States or Spain or whatever. Um, so what can they see? Figurative work, you know, primarily super interested in figurative work. Uh, uh, also a heavy dose of surrealism. I, genuinely enjoy it um, and there you go you know realism different different forms of realism like surrealism pop realism photorealism just I don't know it's what interests me well I definitely see you've got you know some really interesting kind of portraiture that combines some contemporary and uh, traditional art and in the gallery now you've even got some inspired by Alphonse Mucha. That's right, Alphonse Mucha, my guy. Yeah, I, I love Alphonse Mucha. We were speaking earlier, that was one of my first introductions to art. My mom bought me an Alphonse Mucha coloring book and I absolutely loved it. it. You know, and then other people would have like Barbie coloring books and stuff and the lines were so simple and there was just really no detail and it was so boring to me, like after having those ornate headdresses and stuff to play with. 
No, that's, uh, that, that was super interesting for me because I have also always really loved the Art Nouveau movement and I also had a, a MUCA coloring book. Did you really? <laughs> yes. That's awesome. I love that. By the way, those are by my husband. Those are Andres. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's Andres Conde. Um, so how do you balance the demands of being an artist, gallery owner, arts administrator, and all the other hats that you wear? Uh, it's, it's hard. I'm not going to lie. It's not an easy... It's not an easy undertaking, but thank God I have uh, the old ad hood or the ADHD and I can bounce around pretty easily from one, one, side, one topic to another. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that, I guess, in, in that regard. Yeah, it's, a, it's its own special superpower in a way. It is. It's exhausting. I mean, to make no mistake, but it, it, it really is, you know, and it keeps me interested. That's the thing. If I were, I think, just doing one thing, I, I would become bored, you know? Because at the end of the day, as a gallery owner, yeah, you get to show beautiful art and, and you get to put together, or at least it's my favorite part, really, is putting together, curating really interesting exhibitions um, and not being bound to sales, right? But at the end of the day, as a gallery owner, you need sales in order to survive. And P.S., the artists need sales in order to survive. So that can get kind of boring. I mean, at the end of the day, it is sales, you know? So if I didn't have, I think, some of these other outlets plus the thing that I'm selling and something that I genuinely love, I, I think it would, I don't know, it would just be boring for me. Absolutely, and I think interest and in, you know, following those interests really allows you to have that diversity of experience and you bring that to the table no matter uh, what hat you're currently wearing. I make that, thank you. I'm gonna start thinking of it that way. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so can you tell us a little bit about where we can find out more about the gallery and what you have coming up? Sure, so Conde Contemporary is C-O-N-D-E contemporary.com. So you can go online and have a look at the artists that we represent um, and I really encourage people to go and look at the ex uh, exhibitions tab and um, blog and, and read some of the writing accompanying the work. It's really, I don't know, it sort of uh, centers you, you know, you get to really have a better understanding of what's going on. So we have uh, the website, obviously, and then Facebook account, you know, Instagram, the usual, the usual suspects. And subscribe, P.S., you know, sign up for our newsletter and, um, and we won't, we won't uh, immerse you in, in uh, your inbox won't be inundated. We do it probably about once a month. Well, um, the gallery itself here, this is your second gallery, right? You opened this in 2013? Well, the first, yeah, well, it's all Conde Contemporary. Mm -hmm. We had actually our very first gallery in 1990, I don't know, eight, I think. Um, in the design district in Miami. That was the first one. That was Goodman Conde Gallery, and it was wonderful. It was critically a huge success. Um, we took nine artists, and we just built these movable walls and gave them their space and told them to go wild, and it was amazing what they came out with. It was incredible. Sadly, we were very, very young and did not have a strong grasp of sales as we were <laughs> as we were... Uh you know, addressing earlier. So, you know, that we wound up closing that gallery and then reopening it in 2013 as Conde Contemporary. And um, I forgot the question at this point. Where are we? Oh, no, I was just asking, um, you know, just a little bit about the history of you with galleries and uh, got it. just kind of getting a sense of your experience. Um, oh, I remember, right. So we opened it in 2013, again, in Miami, in Little Havana. And then we moved to Coral Gables, which is where we were until the pandemic. Uh, in 2020, you know, I'm, I'm writing checks for this gallery in a very sort of fancy part of Miami, and I'm not allowed to open the doors. So we had already bought a house in Natchez, and uh, I wanted to come up with my mother-in-law, who's elderly, and you know, this was safer a safer place for her, basically. And after being here for a while, everybody's collective blood pressure dropped. And I contacted all of our artists and said, look, we're going to buy a 200-year-old building for the gallery in Natchez, Mississippi, you know. Do you want to come or not? And they said, where? 
And I said, Natchez, this is a beautiful place. You just gotta check it out. And happily, every single one but one uh, came. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kristen Brandt, Arts Industry Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. Today I'm talking with Stacey Conde about Alumare, the light based art exhibition in Natchez. Stacey, can you describe the Alumare Natchez Light Festival for those of us listening? Sure. So Alumare Natchez is a light-based art exhibition and festival um, that takes place here annually in Natchez, Mississippi. This is our first year that we've moved it to downtown. Prior to that, we were at Dunleaf Historic Inn. Um, and we are lighting up different sections of Main Street, Franklin Street, and Memorial Park. What does the name Alumare mean? Alumare means to light up in French. So the name literally means to light up Natchez. And I have to clarify that we do use some really stunning, stunning, stunning lighting, you know, throughout. These are actual art projects. These are real art installations made by actual artists, you know, whose, whose work I have shown in the gallery, uh, at least one of them and others who I absolutely would show this really, really beautiful um, work um, made with the medium of light. And I had the pleasure of participating in last night's uh, exhibit, uh, both as uh, just sharing some information about the Mississippi Arts Commission at your art market, but also getting to walk up and down the downtown Natchez installations. And it's fascinating how interactive you made some of these. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, the artists get all the credit for that. We certainly encourage interactive installations because people love them. You know, they, they love to participate and be a part of the work. So like David Sullivan's piece this year, for example, you stand in front of a, a I guess it's a, a motion sensor. And as you move your arms, you're sort of painting with light on the side of a building. It's really beautiful. Then Wes Kennison and Tyler Durrett did another one that was just stunning. And as you walk by this bank of windows, your face and the movement and, and is projected somehow onto panels behind these huge swaths of hanging fabric. It's, I mean, it's really, these guys are all sort of geniuses in my mind. And it's not just visual. Um, many of the exhibits that I saw had audio components. You were talking about being able to paint with your arms. There was almost a chromatic scale that went with different colors, kind of like a theremin. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And that's part of that's part of how how I curate this exhibition, right? So it, it really is an exhibition, and I'm very interested in not just the visual aspect of it. You know, when you look at Ruth Owen's piece, there's a, there's a musical component that goes along with it. When you look at Christina Molina's work, uh, there's, again, there's a soundscape, and that soundscape was made by just recording sounds on the Mississippi River. Her piece is called Memory of uh, the Miss Lou, or rather, Memory of Miss Lou. So they're incorporating all that. Then we also have uh, Natchez Ballet Academy, doing performances all around. Um, we have uh, Philip Cooper, who made this unbelievable 
12 foot high walking illuminated grandma dot puppet um so yeah anyway we we're trying to involve lots of different mediums it was lovely seeing that you know massive puppet walk mm -hmm. into memorial park leading a parade of children with lights and i understand the lights were also symbolic absolutely so the very first one of these light-based art festivals because they happen all over the world but the very first one was in Lyon, france and it was simply people putting candles in their windows. So imagine the whole town lit up with everybody having just one candle in the window. So we, we spread the word through the community and asked them if they would bring their children and dress them in white if possible. And um, there you go. They all had battery operated candles. So you don't want them to burn down in 300 year old town. Thanks. No, uh, we definitely want to keep fire away from Natchez. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. Um, how did Alu Mayor Natchez come to be when did when you first started this? Because this is your third annual? Yes. So how this started was back in Miami, um, I got together with a developer and the vice president of a huge real estate company. And we were just having this conversation about what we could do to benefit uh, downtown Coral Gables, which at the time was having a real issue renting some of the commercial spaces on Miracle Mile. And we'd all uh, come to the table with this idea of a light-based art festival. It was amazing. All three of us had the same idea. And um, we, we started working on that, putting one together. So we, we wanted to bring art into the city and, and use it, really, um, not just to support artists, uh, but also as an economic driver, right? which art absolutely can be, you know? And if, and if that's the reason people get behind art, good enough. Do you know what I mean? I, I prefer that it's because they absolutely love it and they wanna be a part of it or create it or support artists, teach kids. But if it can help the whole community, why not, right? So that's how it, that's how it started. And even then, I thought, wow, this would be really a great thing that we could do in Natchez use it as an economic driver. Also, it doesn't damage historical architecture. It's ephemeral. It goes up, you know, for two nights and it's gone. And um, it would be a really a great way to introduce a STEAM, like science, technology, engineering, art, and math, um, exhibition to the community at large. So people who might not even typically be interested in an art, in an art exhibition um, would find this festival beautiful and interesting because it is at the end of the day and they're cotton candy you know what I mean so it's a good time yeah and Stacy's referring to uh some of the treats that they had last night and the thing that's very unique about this cotton candy is that it lights up from the inside yes. um it looks like a little floating cloud and I saw so many children enjoying that last night um how have you made this year's show distinct from others I understand there's a theme yeah, every year I create a curatorial theme. Um, this year was sustenance. So the idea was, you know, what sustains us as a community, not just the sustenance, you know, that we get. We've got this incredibly rich soil by the river. And um, so it's, it's not just about the sustenance that we get from the food we eat, but also from what we get from each other psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. Well, that's wonderful. Um, who participated this year in the show? You've talked a little bit about a couple of the installations. Uh, where are they from? So by and large, they're from Louisiana. And that's a little aggravating to me, to be completely honest with you. I, I, I want you know to curate an exhibition with artists from all over, all over the country, all over the world even eventually, this particular exhibition. Um, but I would really love to see some Mississippi artists. You know, so if you're out there and you're working with light, find me, please. I, I really would like to show your work. Um, some of the artists that participated this year are Courtney Egan from New Orleans, Ruth Owens, New Orleans, um, Philip Cooper, New Orleans, uh, John E. Gray, Baton Rouge, uh, Wes and Tyler Kennison, Baton Rouge, you know, um, who else am I missing? David Sullivan, Courtney Egan, New Orleans, I don't know if I said them already. Catherine Pierce, 
The only one that we have from Mississippi, our poet laureate from the state of Mississippi has written us a poem and it's being projected onto the sidewalk. It's beautiful. I, and I love that cross-discipline uh, marrying of uh, art and writing. It really helps people read in a different context. Yes, yes, yes. And interact with those words in a substantive way. Agreed. Um, what are some of the challenges that come with exhibiting light-based art? Well, I don't know, rain. <laughs> rain is problematic. Also, I, I don't know if I said Philip Cooper or not. I want to make sure I said Philip Cooper. Um, so yeah, rain. Rain is definitely a problem. Um, and then you also have, uh, you know, electricity. You have to make sure you have electricity or else uh, you, you wind up having to use generators, which are pretty noisy. Um, with the projected work, you can't have trees in the way. So I often have people going, why don't you use my building? Or why don't you, you know, well, I need a light colored surface and I can't have trees in front of it, you know? So there are some technical, some technical issues with, with some of it, but there's technical issues with everything at the end of the day. And then of course you have to wait for it to be dark. In darkness, yes, we do need darkness. So that does kind of put you in a specific time frame of year. Um, and because this is an annual exhibit, we can kind of expect next year's to be around the same time in early November. Yeah, next year it would be, I think the dates would be like the 8th and the 9th. Um, yeah, I'm really considering moving it to a different time of year, to be completely honest with you, but I probably won't. Pay attention to the website. Let's get that. Get the subscribe to that newsletter. Well, what do you think the magic of light-based art installations really is? I think being out at night, right? Especially as a kid, you don't really get to go out at night like that, you know? So going out at night and seeing something all lit up, it just hearkens to you know, fairs and theme parks and, and things like that. It just has this magical quality about it. You know, the only light that's typically in the skies at night, especially out here, is, you know, the moon and the stars, you know? So seeing, seeing something illuminated that you wouldn't naturally see in an artistic way, I think just is absolutely magical. And everyone, appreciates it, it seems, from the smallest little kids all the way to grandmas. You know, you see the entire family kind of ooing and eyeing at some of this stuff, and it just makes you, it makes you happy. It just makes you really happy to see it. No, I, uh, I, I saw people dancing along with installations last night, and uh, big groups of people kind of following the, the trail that you marked out. So uh, I, I think that this is such a unique program, and the way that I originally found out about this is through our grant program. Uh, Stacy applied for funding through the Mississippi Arts Commission and a project grant to support this festival. And I fell in love with the idea of it and knew that I needed to come and see it. So that's why I'm here now. And we are so grateful because, you know, this is a free event, right? There are aspects of it that are ticketed, like the VIP lounge, simply a fundraiser, you know, and we're, again, grateful for that money. But this, is, this event is free and open to the public. So, you know, when I was a young woman and I had three children, going to the movies was cost prohibitive, you know? So I love that this event gets to be free. I love that people can bring their entire families and that, um, there's not a financial barrier, you know, it's not keeping anyone out. Everybody gets to come, everybody gets to participate, regardless of socioeconomic class. So it's, it's a real big deal. And it's, if, if we didn't have, if we didn't get grants, like the one we got, we're so grateful to get from Mississippi Arts Commission, we simply could not have done this. Well, um, we are so happy to be able to support this program. Um, these types of events are why I like doing what I do, helping make these things happen. And uh, all I have to do is help with the paperwork. You do all the hard, <laughs> heavy lifting. <laughs> the paperwork is the heavy lifting for some of us, trust me. Well, what do you hope that people participating in the festival take home with them? 
a sense of wonder. Uh, I, I have an appreciation for art. Um, I particularly am interested in the children, to be honest with you. You know, we don't have a lot of education, arts education in our public school system. And um, I want them to be inspired. I want them to wonder how this was able to happen, you know, and maybe take a hard look at some of that STEAM education and see how they can apply it, you know, in, in, their, in their careers moving forward. And for those of us who aren't familiar with uh, STEAM, would you provide an example of how that is demonstrated through the work? Sure. So in order to create a 3D map projection, like the one John E. Gray, also from Baton Rouge, by the way, um, created, you've got to incorporate science, technology, engineering, art, and math, because you're art-wise, you're coming up with the concept, you know, you're, you're deciding what colors you're going to use, what shapes, what forms, you know, math, clearly, uh, technology, you're working projectors, you're mapping something, you know, it's, all of that has to come together to create one of these uh, light-based works. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson. President of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kristen Brandt from the Mississippi Arts Commission, and I'm talking with our guest, Stacy Conde. Stacy, in the first half of our talk, we discussed your work as a professional in Natchez and the light-based art exhibition, Elumar Natchez. But Elumar Natchez is presented by your arts-based nonprofit, Arts Danu. What's the mission of your organization? The mission of of Arts Danu is to provide a holistic approach to education, cultural exchange, community outreach, and economic development through the lens of art. So the idea is that a thriving arts program helps to fuel the socioeconomic development of the city. Um, and, and by providing high quality arts education and programming, we are elevating not just the students and the artists that are participating, the community itself, businesses, you know, um, residents, everyone. The uh, communities are so so rich with arts in Mississippi. It's really, I think, our most valuable resource. So, why Natchez? What what drew you here, and how do you feel like you plugged in to this community? Honestly, what drew me to Natchez? I mean, we'll go back to my grandma, who essentially raised me and was from out there. At in Gloucester. So whenever we'd need to go to the grocery store, go out to dinner or go to the mall or something like that, we'd, we'd come into Natchez. So I, I grew up looking at Natchez and thinking, man, those houses look like cakes. Just was so beautiful to me always. And so, you know, when it was time to figure out where I really wanted to be long-term, this was always at the forefront of my mind because I still have a lot of family out there and, in Mac County, and you know, I, I want to be close to them, and I love this place. It's just in my heart. It's in my blood, and it always has been. In terms of plugging into the community, this community has so embraced me, and everything that I'm trying to do. Um, I, I honestly, I, I don't think I've ever felt like this before. You know, when we opened the gallery here, I had local businesses coming and bringing me flowers and plants, and just you know. The mayor is super supportive. The chamber is super supportive. And just everyday, you know, people, residents, the whole community 
has been very supportive of, of the arts in Natchez in general and, and super supportive of us as well. And, you know, you spoke about falling in love with the buildings and now you get to take those buildings and use them like a canvas. I know, it's amazing. It's exciting. I love it. It really is. Um, what are some of the artistic focal points for Arts Danu? Do you focus on specific genres of art or uh, are you working mostly with kids? Yeah, so we're, we really are focused mostly on kids, although this, you know, we had our first teaching artist come in. So Art Standing has a teaching artist residency program and the artists come to stay, live and work for let's say two to six weeks. And in exchange, they teach for free in the community, a set number of classes every week. Uh, so we thought that it would just be for kids, you know, that we do free classes for kids. But as it turns out, the adults went wild. Like they really wanted to participate. And so we do charge for adult classes, which is great because it's, again, a fundraiser. It's a way to pay for the artists to come here in the first place. Um, but yeah, our focus is kids and also, you know, kind of neurodiverse kids. Um, everybody is welcome, but it is my assertion that a large percentage of the artists that I work with and have worked with for the last 10 years have ADHD, have dyslexia, are somewhere on the spectrum. They just process differently, right? And we all know that children with the, this kind of different difference in processing don't typically do really great in school. They often fall through the, the cracks in, in a traditional educational system. So if we can get some of these kids and introduce them to the arts, which they may very well excel at, um, we are really providing a path forward for them long term in their careers, in their lives, in their educations, everything. Earlier, we talked about how you know ADHD is kind of a superpower in your back pocket. It helps keeping keep you fueled and focused on all the different things that you manage. And I think that what you said about ADHD and uh, spectrum disorder, they cause you to process differently. And I think that when you're looking at creative processes, that's almost a leg up. It's almost another layer to being able to get into somebody else's head in a unique way. Uh, agreed, 100% agreed. I mean, one of the, one of the traits of uh, ADHD in particular is pattern recognition. That's huge in art, you know, it's huge in a lot of things, right? I mean, and there, I'm not trying to make it like it's all sunshine and roses. You know, there are some real difficulties associated with some of these, uh, some of these processing issues. Um, but, but yeah, there are absolutely superpowers associated. So who is the Arts Danu team? <laughs> You're looking at her, baby. <laughs> it's a one woman show? <laughs> yeah, right now it's a one woman show. There was a two woman show. Uh, but one, uh, but you know, she took a job with Mississippi Public Broadcasting, and we're so happy for her. That was Lauren Jones Albright. Um, so yeah, I'm over here just uh, making it happen. Well, we're really thankful that you have put in the efforts that you have because you know th these programs wouldn't exist if you hadn't put all that effort in. And I've seen with my own eyes the people who have benefited from this. So thank you. No, thank you. That, honestly, that warms my heart. Thank you. Uh, we talked a little bit about how you found Natchez to be a really supportive community. Do you feel like in return, the city has kind of flavored the art that you're putting out mm. and exhibiting? I, I guess, yes. I mean, I was gonna say no because I didn't immediately see it, but yeah, I suppose it has. You know, I still keep to the themes that we discussed, these eternal, these eternal themes, right? Um, but for example, Christina Molina has created this piece where she's personified the Mississippi River. You know, I'm working with regional artists. We are projecting on these historic buildings. So obviously, you know, there's, there's the flavor there. So yeah, I, I suppose it has, I have, it has. Where, when you're doing uh, programs with your teaching artists, where are you having those educational activities for kids? It depends. So um, we, as we speak, I don't know if you've heard some of the noise as we've been doing this interview, but 
we've got two apartments that are being built upstairs above the gallery. And so when I do have a teaching artist come in, we have a place now where we can house them. Um, the classes, again, happy to donate the gallery space. I prefer to use the community center over here. It's, it's a great space for this. We also, this last time, uh, were fortunate to be able to use the, uh, uh, what's it called, the convention center. And about how many students do you work with um, in a given, I guess, program? Uh, you said artists stay between two and six weeks. Right. Well, this was the first. So we just had a, um, an artist and professor from uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, and he was up for just two weeks. And it was the first time out. So we only had about five kids participating in that particular class but we did do something through the gallery prior to that and we had maybe 15 I would say. And I think that the work that y'all are doing is so interesting. Um, the teaching artists who are brought in get the benefit of you know having a residency experience. They get to get in touch with a new place and expand their creative practice in addition to being able to give back to their host community. A hundred percent. It really is sort of a whole, it, it's like a holistic situation because then the artists are also, so a lot of our artists are from other countries even. And so the idea is for them to come to this part of the world that a lot of people don't actually come to or know a lot about, you know, they just have preconceived notions. So for them to come to Natchez, live and work in Natchez for a period of time, they're going to leave with a whole other perspective and they will be influenced by the town, by the, by the architecture, by the people. I mean, the people are, are I think, the greatest asset of Natchez. And really, again, I love Southwest. Um, so you're pulling in a lot of artists who are not local to Natchez. How do you get in touch with these people? Well, some of them I work with, you know, or I've, I've worked with in the past. I mean, just from being, having this, this iteration of the gallery has been around for 10 years, right? And in those 10 years, I've met a lot of artists. Some of them I've shown, some of them I have not. I'm just aware of them. So, um, it's just based on what I, the skill set I think will be most appreciated by the students at the time. That's who I'm trying to pull in. And what kind of art uh, workshops have you had available? Uh, is it drawing or? Well, so the first one that we did was drawing and it was also education on pop art. It's something that small children really love. So we looked at, um, So we did a, a class on pop art and really focused on uh, Hanu Hanuki, I'm sorry, Haruki Murakami. Then we also did obviously a little Andy Warhol and the, the end product was actually a painting of the Powerpuff Girls. So this was something that the students really appreciated, understood, and were able to get a better grasp of what pop art is, you know, by using something that they were already really, really familiar with. And I love the idea of presenting pop art to kids because it's so deceptively simple. It's something that they can, at a glance, kind of grasp mm -hmm. what the concept is, but the structure and precision that can be required to create that kind of bright, impactful image, um, I think that really resonates with kids. A hundred percent. You know, they see it all the time. It's, it's, they're sold it. You know, it's in their everyday life all the time. So getting to getting them to recognize it for what it is and then execute was was really interesting. And then we also did a little class on surrealism. And then this last class was on sculpture with found objects, which was really important, I thought, because, you know, some students just don't maybe have money for materials. So you really can go out and create art from, from whatever you have around you. And so I really wanted to make sure we did something with found materials, found objects. And then in April, by the way, we have Pablo Santibanez Servat, who is a Chilean artist who lives in Madrid uh, and is a technically 
brilliant painter and also has a little surrealism going on there, photorealism mixed with surrealism. But Pablo is coming in April and he will be our, um, our resident artist. He will be giving classes on classical drawing. And how can people get involved and stay up to date on the events and programs offered by Arts Danu? When, when can we expect to see uh, a little bit more about your upcoming April program? Well, if they just jump online uh, and go to artsdanu.org uh, and sign up for the newsletter, go to alumarinaches.com, sign up for the newsletter. We'll keep you uh, abreast of everything that's happening. And also, please, yeah, it sounds silly at this point to say, follow us on Facebook. But follow us on Facebook. We do put a lot of, do put a lot of information there. Thank you so much, Stacy, for inviting me to come to Natchez and for accepting my invitation to be a part of the Arts Hour. I've had such a great time talking with you about the work that you do and being able to participate in some of the programming personally has really resonated with me. It's always my uh, favorite part of being involved in this grant making process is seeing where the dollars go and who benefits from that. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Honestly, thank you so much for coming and thank you for having me on today, Kristen. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, host of The Original Southern Remedy, the show where I answer your medical questions. Subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on any podcasting app.